it. My name is Don Hoover. I am with the Rivers Equine Center, and I am the lucky one who gets to take care of all her little critters. And she, by, by lucky, she means that. <laughs> I mean it. <laughs> She's never out here. <laughs> Some days luckier than others. Okay, so basically, we are just going to go over basic basic health information about miniature horses. I'm sure some of you do have some. Some of you hope to have some. Okay, how many currently have one or two? Perfect. How many hope to have one? Excellent. Hopefully we won't scare you off today in this little one. So basically with miniature horses, what do we know about them? We know they're cute. I mean, <laughs> they're cute, they're huggable, they can be sassy and elegant, and you can dress them up. <laughs> but the main thing I do want you to remember is because they are small, and they are the same size as dogs. And I have two other cute pictures, but it's not coming across. They are horses, not dogs. And because of this, you do have to treat them like a horse. So they are going to need appropriate nutrition. They're going to need appropriate housing and exercise, and you will have to have regular vet and farrier visits. So, like Stacy said, you know, miniature horses, depending on what registry, registry you are with, but I always just consider 38 inches or less. So that's from the last hairs of their mane to the ground. If you're under 38 inches, you are a miniature horse. And you are truly a horse. They are not ponies. They are horses just on a much, much smaller scale. So we first start hearing about miniature horses in the late 1600s. And these originally were owned by the royal families of Europe. So you didn't have a miniature horse unless you were royal. But then as time passed, they actually discovered that these little guys can actually have jobs. And their first jobs were they actually started using them to pull um, carts and mines. And so that's where they started being used regularly. So we first really got into the United States in the late 1800s, where again, that's why they were brought to the United States, to be used to pull the ore carts in the mines. And it really wasn't until like the 1960s where regular people started having them as pets and starting to enjoy them more. So like I said, miniature horses can have jobs just like big horses. None of my pictures are coming through. But we'll just go back to this one. So they can pull carts. They can pull up to four times their weight. Um, they also can be shown. Um, as Stacy said, you can have confirmation classes. You can have halter classes. There's actually cart classes. Um, they can be ridden. But yeah, you want to be pretty small if you're going to be riding them in. And then, popular therapy horses. And this is Martha, out doing her job, earning her keep. Yes, she is. She is. <laughs> but yes, that's really a growing use of minis, is, is therapy. So, when it comes between the big horses and the little horses, the main difference is just back to size. You need less space for these guys, you need less turnout, and you need less food. So, some of the common health problems that we have with miniature horses. The first and foremost one is obesity. It is really easy for these little guys to get fat. Um, they can just sometimes look at food and, and put on weight. Um, but part of the problem is too, is they're often overfed. It's really hard to look at a miniature horse and guess what their weight is. So you'll have an owner look at their horse and go, oh, you're really thin. I'm sure that, you know, you're not fat. It's just your hair coat. You're really fluffy. So they just feed them extra. Well, as a result, they'll just get a little bigger and a little bigger. So if you actually get past that hair coat and really feel their ribs, you suddenly find out, oh, it's not hair. They're just way too fat. But that hair can also hide a lot in the other extreme, too. You can get miniatures that you think are way too fat, but if you actually feel underneath that really heavy hair coat, they're actually too thin. But the main concern usually, though, is obesity. Um, lack of exercise. It is really easy for these little guys to become pasture potatoes. They just, you know, you can't ride them. They don't necessarily have a job. 
So this is where we start talking about having the exercise regime and making them jog. You know, probably Belle and you know needs a job, so you know she would probably happily uh, come jog your minis. <laughs> Concerned about obesity just because of general health concerns. You know, an obese mini is an unhealthy mini. But we also worry about laminitis. And laminitis is where you get inflammation in all four feet. And this can make their feet very painful. It can make them very, can make it very hard for them to walk. And it can be at times very hard to get them over laminitic episodes. And even if you do get them over the laminitic episode, once they start down that path, they are prone to having episodes over and over again. So once you start, then you really have to change their lifestyle. So we really want to avoid that to begin with. So that's why we do want to try and keep them within a regular weight. We also worry about insulin resistance. An obese mini is way more prone to developing insulin resistance. And what this is, this is when their body has a really hard time regulating insulin and makes them more prone to being laminated. Um, so again, that's why we just really want to watch their weight. But now having said that about insulin resistance, we can see that occasionally show up in, in thin horses also, such as Chloe. Um, Chloe, since Stacy's had her, has never been overweight, but she did develop insulin resistance. But we do consider it more of a, an obese horse problem. <laughs> are also a big issue. And the problem is you've got these really small heads with the exact same number of teeth and sometimes the same size as a big horse. So as a result, there's often not enough space in their mouth for all those teeth. So you get a lot of overcrowding, so their teeth don't line up appropriately, um, so they don't chew as well as they ought to, they're more prone to overbites, underbites, and also part of the problem is then because of all those teeth trying to fit in their head, then oftentimes they'll have sinus issues because the tooth roots are taking up all the space in their sinuses. So we definitely want to keep an eye on that. And I have a really cute picture of a mini with bad teeth, but like I said, the pictures aren't coming across. And then this is just cute fluffy movies. I try to throw in cute pictures. <laughs> Minis like to eat. We know this. It is one of their favorite things to do. Um, however, minis can be more prone to having colicky episodes. And part of this is the fact that they can be indiscriminate eaters. So there are some miniature horses that cannot be bedded on shavings because they literally will eat every shaving in that stall. Um, so you do have to watch that because obviously if you have all those shavings going through their GI tract, more prone to colic. Um, it goes back to their teeth. Um, you know, if they don't have good grinding surfaces or their teeth don't line up appropriately, then you get these big pieces of hay that aren't ground down to smaller pieces trying to move through that small GI tract. And those hay pieces can get hung up in the GI tract, which can make them colic. And then if they're moving through that GI tract slowly, you can get something to develop called a fecal lift. And a fecal lift basically is you know, pieces of um, shavings or a piece of hay, they can just start layering feces around that, and almost like a pearl, and it gets bigger and bigger and harder and harder. So then you'll end up with this really large, dry, hard fecal ball that gets too big to move through their GI tract and can actually get stuck and then have them end up colicking pretty dramatically. And sometimes they end up having to go to colic surgery to be able to remove that. So we just, you know, really want to keep an eye on, on your eating and teeth, and but don't get scared. It's still fun to have a baby. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so another health condition we worry about is hyperlipemia. So we all know that many <coughs> love to eat, but it's okay. But minis have to eat. Minis are interesting in the respect that if they miss even one meal their bodies can actually see that as an emergency. And they will start breaking down fat that is stored in their body to provide themselves energy. So then you can get all this extra fat floating through the blood system. And it's the liver's job to clean up the, the fat. 
So then you can get all this fat setting in the liver and get something called a fatty liver, which can lead them to liver failure or even a disease process called hepatic encephalopathy, which is a neurologic condition because your liver can't function. Um, so this is why after someone calls and tells me their minis skipped a meal, I would be like, okay, we need to look into that just because minis can be delicate in that respect. Um, so yeah, so if Stacy calls and says someone's not eating, I'm like, oh, okay, we need to take a look at that because we just don't want to start down that path of hyperlipidemia because it can be hard to get them over that if they start to have that issue. So your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. This is your, your banamine, your bute, your equiox. We use banamine to treat colic, eye issues. We use bute to treat lameness, um, like if they get a cut. So it is totally fine to use these medications in miniature horses. However, we are just very careful about the dosages we give or how often they get it. Minis can be much more sensitive to these drugs than the big horses and are more prone to developing like a, a colitis, which is inflammation of the colon. So we just, I don't have a problem using them. I'm just gonna really limit the amount or, or how often they get it. Your Questy Wormer. So I love Questy Wormer. It is a wonderful dewormer and it works great. However, I will not use it in a miniature horse unless I have their actual weight. So that means they've either been at the clinic and we've got a weight on them, or like Miss Stacy has her scale, we will weigh her minis and then we will dose appropriately. And the reason I just won't use it on any mini is because they are very sensitive to the quest and being overdosed. And this is in the big horses too, actually, with the quest. So you just don't want to overdose. It can make them sick. So like I said, I love quest and minis, but only if I have a true weight and then I will be comfortable with using it. <laughs> okay, so reproduction. Um, minis have a much higher risk of dystocia, and that's when the baby gets stuck in the birth canal during foley. And this is due to the fact of back to size. Miniatures are just smaller. They have a smaller area to work with. Um, and it's also harder if they're having a dystocia for the vet to get in there and able to try and fix the, the complication. Again, back to, to size. So basically, if you have a miniature mare that's pregnant, I mean, that's why we need to check to see, because it's good to know. Because you really want to keep a close eye on them, eye on them when foaling starts, just in case they do have a problem with getting the baby, baby out of here. Dwarfs, we're going to talk about that just briefly here in a, a couple minutes. Stallions, just say no. <laughs> no one really needs a stallion. Now, if you find a mini and you fall in love with it and it's a stallion and you have to have it, that's fine. Get him. However, just plan on getting him gelded in pretty short order because, again, no one needs a stallion. <laughs> So you have your miniature horse, or even a big horse, so what do you need to plan on, you know, throughout the year? One is just physical examinations. You know, you want to get the vet out, you know, once or twice a year just to look at your mini. You know, we can listen to their heart, their lungs, we can check their eyes, we can check their weight, and, you know, then we can talk about their feeding program. I can tell you if he's too fat. Or maybe you'll get lucky and I'll say, oh, he's way too thin. Um, you know, that way we can just discuss and, and come up with a plan. Vaccinations. There are vaccinations that you are going to want to do every year. Um, the main ones for this area is your eastern and western encephalomyelitis. That is a, a, a mosquito-borne disease. Tetanus. That's if they get a cut. West Nile, which is also a mosquito-borne disease. And then rabies. We have a, a vaccine called a core vaccine that has those, um, those all into one injection. So that helps miniatures because they don't always like shots. Um, but yeah, those are your basic ones. Now, if you're going to be leaving the farm, being exposed to other horses, then you might want to consider a rhino flu. Um, the rhino flu is twice a year, but the others are once a year. A Coggins test it tests for equine infectious anemia. It is a blood draw. It needs to be done once a year. But again, it's only if you're boarding your mini 
or if you're leaving the farm. If your miniature horse stays on the farm and never goes anywhere and you yourself aren't boarding horses, then you don't have to have that done. But if you are going to be a therapy horse or going to shows or going out and about, then it is legally you're supposed to have one. Again, it depends how much you're exposed. I mean, if you're not leaving the farm or going anywhere, you don't necessarily have to. If you're going to be taking your mini to horse shows where they're exposed to other horses, mm -hmm. then it's not a bad idea to do the strangles. A big horse I'll be taking and then bringing it back, and that's why I was thinking exposure that yeah, way. You can definitely do that. Fecal exams and deworming. It is good to get fecal exams done at least twice a year. Um, they can be done more often, but they only twice a year. You can just see what your parasite load is, um, and then we can plan a deworming schedule um, based on that. Dental exams and floating. It's good to have their teeth checked at least yearly and then get them floated as needed. Because again, we just want to keep those teeth under control so they're chewing the best that they can. And if you have a little gelding, cheap cleanings. Enough said. <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> There's really nothing more to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so like I said, we're just going to briefly touch on dwarfism in miniature horses because our two favorite dwarfs live here. So we got Booker and Martha. So dwarfism occurs in the miniature horses due to mutations or deletions in the genetic makeup. So these changes in the genetic makeup can result in really small sized horses. These are the ones I often see that are so little. You can end up with abnormal conformation of their legs. So they can have really crooked legs. They can be really short spined, more prone to being pot bellied. They can have really short necks. Um, they can have abnormal shaped heads. They can have bulging foreheads. They can have bulging eyes. They can have nostrils that don't necessarily set in the normal place. They can be just a little bit higher setting on their heads. Um, and these abnormalities can be very minor to the point where they can live really relatively normal lives and it really doesn't necessarily affect them. Two miniatures that are so affected, or dwarfs that are so affected, that it can be very hard for them to stand on their own. It can be very hard for them to walk. And a lot of these little ones can live in chronic pain just because everything is so abnormal in their legs. It is estimated that there's about 50% of the miniature horse population are either affected, so they're actually dwarfs, or they are carriers of the dwarf genes. And the reason this is so prevalent in the miniature horse um, population is because originally the goal has always been with the breeders to get smaller and smaller horses, because obviously, the smaller they are, that's pretty cute. However, as a result of this, unfortunately, the smallest horses that we usually get are dwarfs. So a lot of the dwarfs have been used as breeding stock. So it has just perpetuated these abnormal genes. And I did have a picture, but again, it's missing. Um, it was a picture of a stallion that was used a lot in the early 70s. And he was a dwarf but he was really popular, they used him. So again, he just perpetuated those abnormal genes. And so that's why we see it so much. So we currently have genetic tests for two types of dwarfism. We have APAN dwarfism, which is Booker, and we have Bell dwarfism, which actually is Martha. So I encourage you that if you have a miniature that you're considering using for breeding, that you do the genetic testing to see. I mean, it may not be obviously a dwarf, but you could be a carrier. And you just want to know that before you breed um, to the stallion or the mare, you know, what their status is. Because there are some, there are some combinations that are actually lethal. Um, there are foals with certain combinations of these genes that won't survive. The mare will always miscarry, um, or if they're born, they have to be euthanized soon after because they are so abnormal. And it gets back to just perpetuating um, dwarfism. We, we really need to, to stop. And these are just some other pictures of APAN dwarfs. You can see, you know, short spine, hot belly, crooked legs. You can see this one has a really short neck, abnormal shaped head. 
Um, and they can, like I said, you can have as, as few of abnormalities where they can live a pretty normal life to a whole combination of, of different ones. The dwarfism, which I said was like Martha, and kind of cute picture of Martha, but I don't know where all the time. But anyway, the dwarfs and Martha has something called skeletal attitude. And this basically causes the really abnormal limb development. If you've seen pictures of Martha, you can see that her front legs are, are really crooked. And this is because Martha actually has extra bones. These dwarfs with the skeletal atavism are basically a throwback. And if you look at some of Mark's samples over there as like really early horses, you will see that they have a separate radius and ulna. We have a separate radius and ulna. But in today's horses, their radius and ulna on their front legs and their fibula and tibia, tibia on the back legs are actually fused together into one bone. Well, Martha's legs aren't fused, so she has basically extra bones, and that's what causes the, the deformity. And this is just a picture of an example of it, of it fused together. You've got it separate up here, but then it fuses into one long bone. And then I had another picture of it showing it separate, but best leg plans. <laughs> So basically, so that's why I just want to briefly touch on dwarfism, just because it is a problem that we see. It seems like dwarfs suddenly have really gained in popularity, and people are really wanting to own dwarfs. Um, I just want to prepare you that if you do get a dwarf, you just have to be prepared. These little guys have a lot of health issues. They have a lot of abnormalities, and these are health issues that are going to have to be dealt with their whole life. So it can definitely be a financial drain. Um, it can also be an emotional drain on um, the owner, just because they do have these health issues, and they can also have a, a shorter lifespan. Medical supplies to have at home, I think you briefly touched on this, but you know, thermometer, stethoscope, your bandage material, which is like bamboo roll cotton wrap. That's in case, you know, if you get a cut, you can put a wrap on it till the vet gets out there. Um, triple antibiotic in case for an ointment. If you just have a small abrasion wound, you can treat that accordingly. So, emergencies happen. You know, at some point, you are going to need to call the vet. Even if it's just, you're not really sure if it's an emergency or you just want to call and talk to set up a routine appointment, it's good to, to have a relationship with a veterinarian, so you will call and talk about that. Have a plan in case of the emergency. Like, say, your mini gets, has a problem where it's going to need to go to the clinic or to a, a hospital. Just know how you're going to get them there. So just have a plan. Know how to get your temperature, pulse, and respiration. Take a deep breath. It'll be okay. And basically, always call the vet. I mean, if you have questions or concerns, it's always, like I said, just good to call and talk. And I have this awesome picture right here. <laughs> it was of a horse who somehow had fallen into like a manhole. Wow. And his back end was in the hole and his front leg was up. And it says, like, I have a perfectly, perfectly reasonable explanation for this. <laughs> but again, no picture. And I had a picture here, too. <laughs> <laughs> Standing all in a row, looking all cute with flowers behind them. Oh <laughs> we can envision it. Envision it. Picture it. Okay, so that's basically miniature horse medicine in a nutshell. I mean, it's very brief, but it's just to give you a basic knowledge. If you're thinking about getting one, if you have one, it's just to kind of review. Um, and if you always have questions, you can always call and talk. Or if you have questions now. Um, can you speak to trachea? I am on the ultimate I guess, demise, but they're treating it for asthma. But is this a common thing that they, they buckle and they twist? And, and Minis are more prone to getting something called tracheal collapse. Mm. And it's not, we don't see it all the time in miniature horses, thankfully. But if we have a mini that's having some breathing issues or they're making noise, that's always one of our first thoughts. Are they one with tracheal collapse? Um, it definitely, yes, can shorten their, their lifespan. And more, the more obese they are, that actually can make it worse because it definitely puts pressure on that trachea. Um, any stressful um, 
thing is even as simple as vaccines can stress them and make their tracheas collapse. So is it really common or is it not really? It's not that common, but again, it, we're never surprised when we see one. I mean, like with all of Stacy's, none of them have tracheal collapse. We kind of worried about Booker at first, um, but then we, he, what we thought was going on went away. So it is definitely more pre prevalent in the miniature horses. So don't, I mean, it's there and there's always that possibility, but we don't see it all that often either. So I, yeah, I don't have a perfect answer on that one. It's like some of those diseases where we don't see them, but yet when we do see it, we're not surprised. So it wouldn't stop me from getting a miniature horse with the concern of that. It is a concern, you know, especially when the breeding thing, while it's cold, it's an asthma type of thing, and then it's not. Right, because oftentimes that's what we think. When we first hear them make that noise, we're like, okay, do you have a cold going on? You got a virus? And then we find out that it just continues. And then a lot of times we'll take x-rays and we'll like actually can see the collapse on, on x-rays. Thank you. You're welcome. Will people uh, tend to do vet checks before you actually purchase a mini, or is that just something that's not? Not too often. I've never done a, a pre-purchase on, on a miniature horse. No. <laughs> Man, if we did yeah, what you get. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, sometimes on a miniature horse, if we did pre-purchases, I'd be like, oh, well, this is wrong. This is wrong. <laughs> this is wrong. I feel free. <laughs> Yeah. Do a pre-purchase. It's just something we have never done one. Yeah, I was just curious. Right. <laughs> Any other questions? I have a question. I don't know if this is even applicable, but um, is there anything you can do proactively for the the lame, you know, being for the laminitis? In, yeah, for the laminitis. I mean, it, like a human, you know. You, I don't know if you have arthritis, you could take Celebrex or whatever. Is there anything, once it shows up, is there anything that... It mainly before that is really watching their weight. Uh -huh. um, if we have ones that were suspicious that it could be insulin resistance or something like that, we get blood work and we see where their insulin levels are. Uh -huh. I mean, yeah, the goal is to try and stop it before. Right. So unfortunately, though, a lot of times it's like, yeah, doing a blood test for insulin resistance. If their insulin is really high, there's medication we can put them on called metformin to try and, and get those levels under control. Sometimes they respond, sometimes they don't. Um, but then it's back to, to weight and exercise. You know, we try to get their weight down, we try to have them exercising to keep their weight at a, a decent level. You know, it's just trying to prevent. But yeah, because there's really not a lot otherwise that we can do ahead of time. Or like if they don't shed out, you know, like even there's Cushing's disease, which is another, you know, we just try to watch them and then test accordingly. I know your practice is in this area, but are you aware of anybody in the Kansas City area of five <laughs> that um, has experience with minis off the top of your head? I don't know about minis in particular. I mean, there's obviously Will Hyde Freeze does equine over in the Kansas City area. Right. I mean, I do know of that practice, right. but I, I don't know, okay. you know how much mini work like they do. Oh, that's a good question. Could you talk to on feed since... Um, AAA or A plus brought up grown when could you explain the difference between a ration balancer and you know regular feed or grain that they may be using? Okay. So a ration balancer, which is what grown one is, basically this is made if you just have your horse on hay and you don't have them on grain. A ration balancers are basically to make up the minerals and, and the protein that maybe they're not getting since they're only on a hay diet. So there's a lot of horses out there, big and small that basically because they do have, you know, where they don't necessarily need all the grain, all the calories, we'll just keep them on grow and win and, um, and their hay. And then the grain, obviously grains, you got calories. I mean, there's horses that are working that need more calories and they'll be fed accordingly. But yeah, so grow and win is a ration balancer. So like it can uh, enrich? Yes. Enrich. Yes. It is. Okay, now how many of you want minis? <laughs> I want everybody's hands. Good. How many did I scare away from ever wanting a mini? <laughs> That's okay, there's always one. <laughs> it's better to know now. I have big guys. Let's see, you got bigs. That's okay. And I have a 105 pound Labrador, and so he's one That qualifies as a mini. Yeah. <laughs> All right, any other questions? All right, perfect, then I will end it up. Oh, right here, right? Yeah. <laughs> Great.